presenting six technical tips for tech startups. I'll start uh, by introducing myself. Uh, my name is Ahmed Misbah. I'm a chief uh, software engineer and uh, architect. I'm a speaker at uh, multiple uh, places and events. Uh, these include uh, Delta Technopreneurs, uh, DevOps Day, Cairo. Uh, this conference, of course, Orange Dev Test Days, GDC, and uh, GDG. Topics of interest. Um, I like um, reading and talking about uh, DevOps, Agile and Lean, cloud native apps, and whatever that is beyond that. Software architecture, Java and its ecosystem. Uh, free and open source software and artificial intelligence and it's different tasks including machine learning and deep learning. A little bit about my experience. So I've been working at Orange Innovation Egypt which is uh, uh, the R&D arm uh, of uh, Orange Egypt for nine years now. I've delivered two award-winning uh, projects uh, worked at two uh, startups, uh, two of them have failed by the way, and um, helped many others. Um, winner of the Dell Hacktrick 2022 UI UX track, and um, I've got a master's degree in machine learning and many other uh, professional uh, certificates. So what's our agenda for today? So. I'm going to start by introducing the topic. So we can't talk six technical tips until we first talk about what is a startup and what is a tech startup and um, how the ecosystem is doing, a little bit of statistics, just a couple of things we need to talk about to introduce the topic and then start with the technical tips and then we're going to conclude all of that. So let's start first with an introduction and um, let's define what a startup is. So a startup is a company or project undertaken by an entrepreneur to seek, develop and validate a scalable economic model. Okay, so um, I've highlighted here the key terms. So entrepreneur seek, develop, and validate. Scalable economic model. So this is what a startup is all about. So what's different about this definition is that a startup doesn't necessarily have to be a company. It can be a project or an initiative within a company of whatever size and scale. Okay, You can consider that as a startup. It has to be taken by an entrepreneur, okay? And we all know that in contemporary factors of production, entrepreneurship has become the fourth factor of production along with capital, land, and labor, okay? So you can't have a startup unless you've got entrepreneurship uh, as a spirit and as a mindset. And you have to seek, develop, and validate a scalable economic model. So you don't start from the beginning knowing exactly what you're going to do and how it's going to grow, okay? You discover that over time. So this is what a startup is all about. Here's another definition by Investopedia. So a startup is a young company founded by one or more entrepreneurs to develop a unique product or service and bringing it to the market. By its nature, the typical startup tends to be a shoestring operation with initial funding from the founders or their friends and families. So again, I've highlighted a couple of important points in this uh, definition. Firstly, a startup has to develop a unique product or service, okay? Um, and it has to bring it to the market. If it doesn't bring it to the market, then there's no innovation, there's no customers, there's no feedback, there's no pivoting, then this is basically not a startup. And it has to be unique, because otherwise, 
how is it going to attract customers? What is there in this product that is going to make people buy it or consider it? And a startup always begins as a shoestring operation, okay? What's a shoestring operation? A shoestring is something that is very simple, right? Your shoelaces, they're very simple. And a startup tends to be like that. It's a shoestring operation, meaning that it operates with very, very minimal resources. Uh, and when we say resources, we mean human resources and monetary resources. Okay, so I've defined what a startup is. Let's define what a tech startup is. So a technology startup, also known as a tech startup, is a company, obviously, that provides technology products and services to the market. They are companies that deliver either technology products or services that are new in the market. And this is very similar to the definition uh, we have uh, described earlier about startups in general. Uh, or so it delivers something new to the market or delivers something that already exists, but in a different way. So when we say different way, it can be a different way of marketing, a different pricing strategy, a different niche market, a different platform, whatever. So it can be the same service, but introduced to the market in a different way. So, for those of you who are following the startup ecosystem, you will realize that there is a huge rise in the number of startups every year. Every year we hear about new startups introducing new mobile apps, new websites, new services. So, um, how can we translate that into numbers? So, since 2007, the number of tech startups has increased by 47%. So from a 116K companies in 2007 to 171 companies in 2016. That's a huge number because we're talking here about companies, not about something else. The United States averages 20 technology companies founded per year that reach $100 million in revenues and is currently leading other countries with a total of 71K startups. Today, the most valuable companies in the world are tech startups or started as tech startups are and are now very big corporates and enterprises. Those include names that all of you recognize Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and Meta. So the companies that started as tech startups in the late 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, are now the most valuable companies in the world. So the numbers seem motivating, but um, it's not all sunshine and roses. In 2019, the failure rate of startups was around 90%. Research concludes that 21.5% of startup fails in the first year, 30% in the second year, 50% in the fifth year, and 70% in their 10th year. So with big numbers, you definitely have a lot of failures. And as we can see, in the startup world, the failure rate tends to be really, really high. So why do tech startups fail? Or why do startups fail in general? So these re reasons for startups failing can include money running out, choosing the wrong market to introduce the product in, 
lack of research, bad partnerships, etc. There, there are lots of reasons that could lead a startup to fail. And you've seen infographs like this with lots of different reasons why startups fail. And only one of those can be the deal breaker, can be the, the fatal blow, can cause your startup to fail. Let's talk about failures in tech startups. So why do tech startups fail? Let's start with numbers. So out of this big number, 90% failure rate, 63% of this failure rate is in tech startups. So tech startups have the highest failure rate of all startups. So researchers and experts have identified a couple of reasons why these startups could fail. Poor products, no market needs, lack of business model, failure to pivot, ignoring customers and their feedback. And what's important to this session and what is significant are the last two. Poor technology choices and poor technical practices. So in 2011, Eric Ries, who worked in tech startups, wrote The Lean Startup. Um, in his book, he understands that the failure rate in tech startups is high, but he believes that if you run the startup using the lean mindset, the startup will have a greater chance of succeeding. So when you read about the lean startup in any website that introduces the book, it says that most startups fail, but many of those failures are preventable. The lean startup is a new approach being adopted across the globe changing the way companies are built and new products are launched. So Eric Ries is trying in his book to basically tell startups how not to be in the 90% failure rate. So we've defined what a startup is. Eric Ries' book is titled The Lean Startup. So what does lean mean? Lean is a way of thinking that originated in manufacturing. So it's about creating the most value. And when we talk lean, the value is basically what you bring to the customer. That is value. At the minimum cost, which is achieved by minimizing resources, time, energy, and effort. What we call in lean thinking or lean manufacturing, waste. So what you're trying to do adopting lean thinking is basically trying to give customers or users the most value, but with the least amount of resources and cost. Because if you remember, we said that one of the reasons that start a fail that they run out of money. Well, obviously, resources, time, energy, effort, etc. all of this equals money. Sorry. OK, so Ries was a senior software engineer with their Inc., which had failed, which had a failed, expensive product launch. So Eric Ries really wrote this book coming out of the trenches. Ries saw that the error in both cases in the companies that failed was that they worked forward from technology instead of working backward from the business. And this is the business they're trying to achieve. So basically, they got it all backwards. So instead of focusing on a business problem, and adopting the technologies required to solve this problem and deliver 
innovative solutions, they first focused on the technology and they moved their way from the technology to the product, which is not the right thing to do. So instead, Rees argues that to build a great company, one must begin with the customers. So not even with the product. You don't start with the product in a lean startup. You first start with the customer. You need to understand what the customer needs through interviews, research, discovery. Some people call that design thinking. Other call it lean UX. Lots of different names. But at the end, what we want to do is first understand what the customer needs. Then, once you've understood what the customer needs, you start building an MVP, a minimum viable product. And we'll talk about that in a second. Once you build the MVP, you deliver to the market as quickly or as soon as possible. You test it, you get feedback, and then you repeat that process iteratively until you have something that is stable and can scale. Sometimes we call these iterations pivoting. You're trying out different business models until you reach the best product market fit. Okay, so, so what we said earlier was that Reese's idea of a tech startup or a lean startup is that you start with the customer, you build an MVP, you deliver the MVP to the market, you get feedback, you do this process iteratively until you reach a product market fit, the best product market fit. So what is an MVP? MVP is abbreviation for uh, minimum viable product. Minimum basically means the most rudimentary, bare bone foundation of the solution possible. So you don't build the whole solution. You build a skeleton of the solution, okay? Something the customers can try out, and then you start um, fixing that, building upon that, improving that, optimizing that until you reach the optimum product. Viable, sufficient enough for early adopters. So it has to be something that the customers can actually use, okay? Not just something that is bare bone and is, is, is not usable. And product, well, it has to be something tangible. It has to be something that the customers can touch and feel. So this is what a minimum viable product is. And this is what you want to start with. This is the cheapest version of the value you want to deliver. And this is definitely the value that you can deliver soonest. So we were talking about running this in iterations. These are the main or major phases that you execute iteratively. So you start by building the MVP, then measuring feedback coming from this MVP, and then using these this feedback to learn, and then all of what you have learned, you leverage that so that it would be an input again to the build phase. And you do this iteratively. This is a flow chart that basically says this process, describes this process in a little bit of detail. So you start with an idea, you um, develop a hypothesis, you build an MVP from the hypothesis, you deliver the MVP, you experiment, whatever feedback you get, you use that to learn, and then you check whether you have something that is stable and you can continue with. The hypothesis has been proved or you pivot and you repeat the process again. So we were talking about pivoting. 
This is basically how pivoting looks like. So it's basically what happens between discovery and validation. And to deliver the most value with the least cost. We said that the failure rate is high and that one of the ways we can prevent our startup from being one of the startups that failed out of the 60 something percent startups that fail every year, we need to run in a lean way. And we've said that we always have to start with the business idea, with what the customers want, and then see how the technology can serve that. So based on all of this, I recommend these six technical tips for tech startups. From experience, working on startup projects and helping out tech startups, I find that these technical tips will truly help tech startups run using the lean startup cycle. So what are these uh, technical tips? And um, this is the 2022 edition. I like keeping editions, why? This is not different from the 2021 edition, but it's good to keep you know, uh, a track of the editions, why? Because these tips can change over time. What works in 2022 doesn't necessarily have to work for the coming years. So these technical tips are go serverless, go cross-platform or progressive web apps for developing mobile applications, apply Pocayo and testerless approaches, Choose your programming language or languages wisely. Data is the new goal. Data is king. And seek experts to review your design and technology choices. Let's start with the first tip. Go serverless. So let's first define what serverless is. So serverless architectures are application designs that incorporate third party Backend as a service and e ephemeral containers that run code on what is called function as a service. So let me put that in, in simpler terms. So it's basically where you try as much as possible to use services that are third party instead of developing these services from scratch and basically running your code on platforms that will handle the scalability, where the code is going to run, its availability, etc., without you have to worry, having to worry about all of this. In order to significantly reduce the operational cost, complexity, and engineering lead time. So, Basically, serverless architectures are composed of two things. Backend as a service, these are basically the third party services we talked about. This can be a service that offers authentication and authorization, a service that offers a real time database, a service that offers um, a queuing, etc. Cloud hosted, fully managed by the cloud. You don't have to do that on your own. And then function as a service. This is where instead of writing code, which you have to run against a runtime environment, which you have to deploy manually into a virtual machine on the cloud, and you have to manage that virtual machine, handle uh, its uh, security, scalability, etc. You don't have to do all of that. You can use function as a service on the cloud to just write your code, send it to the platform you want, and the platform will handle everything. So basically, serverless is function as a service, union, backend as a service. This is an example of how you can use 
services by AWS to build a complete solution using serverless architectures. So as you can see, AWS offers you everything from authentication, distributed object stores, content delivery networks, function as a service, uh, queuing, notification services, different types of data stores, and all of this is cloud managed. You don't have to manage any of this. So what's the benefits you get from this as a startup that is aiming to operate as a shoestring operation with the minimal cost and effort? Reduced operational costs, easier operational management, reduced development costs, improved scalability and scaling costs, greener computing, less time to market, better flexibility, and more focus on UI and UX, which is basically what you want to be doing. You want to be focusing more on the customer needs than actually building the product, because you want to deliver something quickly to get feedback quickly. But that doesn't mean that we want to deliver something that is of poor quality or will not meet the non-functional requirements of the solution. No, we actually want that. And the best thing about service architectures is that you get non-functional requirements out of the box. You don't have to worry about those. The cloud does all of that for you, or most of that, at least. More benefits, increased developer productivity and faster development time. Again, we are a shoestring operation. We want to deliver sooner, so the less time we take to develop, the better the productivity, the sooner we deliver things to market. No one is responsible for server management, so you don't have to hire dedicated uh, system administrators or DevOps engineers. Or you don't have to do all of that. Easy to scale as horizontal scaling is managed by the platform, so you don't have to worry about traffic rising, and you have to continuously monitor the, uh, the infrastructure, etc. The cloud does all of that for you. You only pay for what you consume. That is good, because you don't want to be paying a lot of money for resources that you don't use. Functions can be written in almost any programming languages if you're using function as a service, and you get lots of free tier. And you actually want this free tier because, again, an MVP is something that is expendable. It's something that most probably you're going to get rid of and develop something else. So you don't want to host that on something that is going to cost a lot. And this is what you get with serverless architectures. You get lots of free tier with that. So again, let's not forget the lean startup cycle. When we talk about serverless architectures or any of the coming technical tips, we have to see the benefits we're going to get or, or what practices is it going to let me be able to adopt in the lean startup cycle. So we get cloud computing, cluster immune systems, just-in-time uh, scalability. We get all of these benefits. When you write function code as a function as a service, you write very little units of code. So this gives you the capability to be able to write better unit tests, etc. So it's not about just the technology. It's how the technology is going to allow me to adopt the lean startup cycle. And serverless architectures allow us to um, adopt many of the practices in the uh, build uh, phase. Tip number two, go progressive web applications or cross-platform when it comes to mobile uh, app development. So before discussing the benefits, usually when startups want to deliver some solution that is going to run on a mobile device, they will want to target the different platforms that are available in the market, Android, iOS, Huawei, so that they would cover a larger 
uh, user uh, segment. If you don't adopt cross-platform technologies or progressive web applications as a technology for web building mobile apps, you will either have to hire a developer for each platform if you want to deliver this at once, or you will have to deliver this sequentially. So the same developer or developers are going to develop something for Android, then develop something for iOS, then perhaps develop something for Harmony. With cross-platform technologies and PWAs, you get the capability to deliver solutions on all platforms by writing a single code base. This is very beneficial because you have 80% shared code base so basically you write code once and it runs on these different platforms. Reduced development costs, high speed performance, and fast and scalable apps. And this is exactly what you want if you're going to develop an MVP. This is exactly what you would want when you're running a shoestring operation. This is exactly what you would want if you're going to adopt the lean startup way. This basically shows the different technologies that can be used uh, to um, develop applications using cross-platform uh, technologies. I think the most popular one now is Flutter. Uh, this is the most uh, popular uh, cross-platform uh, technology out there. And uh, I personally recommend it for uh, uh, developing mobile apps. Okay, But you have different uh, options. You have React Native, you have Xamarin. So, so you, you, you have other choices to choose from, OK? But basically, getting back to the lean startup, what benefits are you going to get? Well, the main benefit is that reduced cost launch to different platforms, Applications are going to scale, etc. This is exactly what you need when you want to deliver an MVP. Tip number three, apply Pokayoke and testerless approaches. So let's first start with the problem before we describe what Pokayoke is. Most startups start without a dedicated testing or QA team. And um, when you don't have that, sometimes you don't give much effort to the testing activities. And when you don't do that, you deliver poor quality products. And when you deliver poor quality products, your startup will fail. So if you're a startup that cannot yet afford to hire uh, a testing team, what can you do? Well, you can still test using these approaches without a dedicated testing team. So Pokayoke is one of the approaches. Pokayoke is a Japanese term for mistake proofing or prevention. So it's basically a development process that motivates or encourages uh, developers to start with writing the tests the tests that would validate and verify that we are designing the right solution and that the solution is designed right. Once we have that, we start developing the solution itself. What is known in software development as test-first approaches or test-driven development. Here is a very simple example of how mistake-proofing works. So the way USB is designed, or HDMI is designed, or the way electrical plugs are designed, when they are fault proof, there's no way you can plug them in the wrong way. Because they are designed using mistake proof approaches. So no way an end user can make a mistake. We use the same mindset when we are developing technology products. By first writing the tests, we make sure that we are going to write 
or develop a product that meets these tests. So it's going to be mistake proof. So this is Pokayok. What about testerless approaches? So basically testerless approaches involves executing a number of activities to promote testing and software development in the absence of software testers. This is commonly applied in startups that lack software testers. And you'll be surprised that it's applied in Facebook and Yahoo um, up till today. So it's OK not to have testers, but it's not OK not to test. And there's no excuse. You can apply testerless approaches. So what are these testerless approaches? So you've got a couple of approaches that apply Pokayoke. Those include TDD, BDD, ATDD, FDD. And then you've got other practices like test automation, dog fooding, continuous monitoring, log aggregation, distributed tra tracing, and crash reporting. And you see here different technologies which you can use. So basically, you can use these software development practices to write the tests and then write the production code. And then you can use dog fooding. This is where you try out the product yourself before delivering it to the customers. And um, when you deliver the product to the customers, you want to get feedback. You want to know what is crashing, what is not working, what is being used, what is not being used and why. How do you do that? By basically having monitoring tools, okay? So um, you can use Crashlytics, Instabug. Those are popular tools you can use on mobile devices to monitor what has crashed, what is going on, etc. So there's no excuse to deliver poor quality products even when you don't have a testing team. You can still do testing using these approaches, and you can still deliver quality products. Going back to the lean startup, so how does this tip help you achieve uh, you know, lean startup practices? So you get unit testing. When you do unit testing, obviously, you need to run that in an automated way, so you have continuous integration. You have refactoring when you're doing TDD. Uh, you've got split testing. You've got smoke testing. So you've got real-time alerting. So basically, real-time monitoring as well. So tip number three is all about delivering quality products by applying these practices in order to be a true lean startup. Tip number four, choose your programming languages wisely. So from experience, I saw lots of startups move towards the road of failure by simply choosing the wrong programming language. So how do you choose the right programming language? These are a couple of things which you have to consider. The programming language's learning curve. So how long do I need in order to learn this language? Believe it or not, some languages are harder than others. Not all languages are the same. And some programming paradigms are harder than others. So this is something that you need to consider when you are looking for a programming language to use to develop your tech product. The availability of developers. You can choose the best programming language there is. But if there aren't enough developers to hire that are experienced in this programming language, you're in trouble. Ecosystem and community for the support and seeking help online, compiled or interpreted. Connection with other programming languages and ecosystems. The vendors and platforms that support this programming language. Is it cloud native or not? Because remember when we talked about serverless architectures, if I choose a programming language that doesn't work with function as a service, I won't be able to use serverless architectures. The demand and industry trends. 
some programming languages are outdated, so they're not trendy. So why use them? And longevity. This is very important. Don't choose a programming language which is still new and you don't know whether people are going to continue supporting it and uh, improving upon it. Questions to ask in addition to these different criteria. So the good question to ask is which language suits most for whatever I want to develop or which languages are used for whatever I want to develop. The worst question you can ask is which language is the best because there is no best language. So you always ask these two questions. Which language suits this particular use case, this particular platform, this particular technology, in addition to the criteria we've described earlier? Tip number five, data is the new gold, data is king. So a quote by Arthur Doyle, I never guess. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data insensibly one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. So what, what Arthur Doyle is trying to say here is that don't take decisions especially when you're doing business just based on instinct, just based on what you think, based on a hypothesis and um, I've read an interesting article saying that usually the people who make the decisions are the hippos, the highest paid employees in the room. Those are the people that make most of the decision. Why? Because they have the most influence. When you uh, apply this tip, you're adopting what is called a data-driven approach or a data-driven company, okay, where you collect data and you make decisions based on data. So why is data important? Why would you want to collect data? Why is it the new gold? Why is it king? Because you can do all sorts of different tasks with data. Business intelligence, business and data analytics, artificial intelligence, and it's different tasks like machine learning and deep learning. When you have lots of data, you start using big data technologies to get insight from the data, interesting information, which you can infer based upon. When you collect data, it increases your awareness of security and privacy. It helps you understand how to protect the data and how to secure it and it increases your awareness of regulation and compliance. If you're into banking, using credit cards, etc., you might be interested in PCI. If you're going to develop an application that is going to collect data in the European Union from European citizens, you might be interested in the GDPR, for example, which protects the privacy of European citizens. So unless you're collecting data, you're never going to have this awareness. So how do I collect data? There are different platforms which you can use or embed in your mobile app or web app or desktop app to collect data like Google Analytics and Follow Analytics. And these solutions offer you uh, out of the box dashboards which you can use to get interesting insights like Pirate Metrics for example. So, it's not hard to collect data anymore. You can just create an account on one of these platforms, include very little pieces of code in each screen, and the data is going to be collected, and then you're going to have this data 
displayed in, in fancy dashboards which will help you uh, make informed data-driven decisions. And you can perhaps use this data later on for data monetization. You can actually make money out of this data. These are some infographs just to explain how data is collected using the big data ecosystem. So I'll let you watch that offline. Okay, so back to the lean startup. So we said that we have the measure phase and the learn phase, and in between you have data collection. So this tip is directly related to this. It's a direct mapping with these two phases. So you need to collect data, you need to understand the importance of data in order to be able to measure based on certain KPIs and metrics. And you will use this in order to be able to learn and further improve your product or service. The last tip, seek experts to review your design and technology choices. So this is, this is a common mistake that tech startups make. They want to rush something into the market. So they start with a small, inexperienced team. They build something. They deliver to the market. And all hell breaks loose. According to this graph, the later you discover issues and bugs, the higher the cost of fixing the bugs and the higher the indirect costs. Lost customers, lost reputation, lost partnerships, etc. And perhaps you lose the whole company. So we have what is called the shift lift mindset. It's basically trying to validate and verify as early as possible. If possible, from the requirements phase. The earlier you discover issues, the less the cost of fixing these issues, and the less the indirect costs. That's why they call it the shift lift mindset. So actually, you're trying to move the validation and verification activities to the early phases of the development of a product. And this is what the sixth tip is all about. It's about seeking expert help as early as possible, in the early phases of the product development life cycle. And what I'm saying is not new. For those of you who are into software development, actually there are agile practices that uh, motivate developers to seek help from others. Like code reviews, when you ask your peer to review your code before it is delivered. Quick design sessions. This is where we all sit and discuss the design before it is actually implemented. And you can seek experts and professionals in this phase. Pair and mob programming. This is where two people or a couple of people uh, collaborate in order to develop a single feature. It's all about knowledge sharing, seeking help. Uh, sharing knowledge and expertise. So this is actually something that is not new. It's something that we do on a daily basis in software development. So why not do it when you are starting a startup, working on a new idea? So I get asked the question, how do I find experts? There are lots of ways. LinkedIn, Tech Twitter. If you join an incubation program, you are usually provided with a consultant that can help you at early stages and during the development of the product. Conferences, online and offline meetups and talks. Usually people who deliver sessions or talks are experts in this particular area. So if you are developing a product that is related to someone's area of expertise, you can always seek that someone in these places. And freelancing platforms. You can hire someone 
for a couple of days, for a couple of months, just to help you get started or to help you with something you're stuck in and then move on. So this is the sixth tip. Try to seek expert help as early as possible. Why? It helps you prevent a lot of the issues and the problems that occur in later stages in a startup's life cycle, which can cost the startup a lot. So, conclusions. So this tutorial builds upon ideas proposed by Eric Ries' Lean Startup Strategy. I've explained six technical tips that you can use to build an MVP and then test and iterate quickly to achieve a better market fit with less waste. These technical tips cover areas such as programming languages, development platforms, cloud native architectures, testing and big data. And last but not least, keep innovating. Thank you.